So welcome to a new set of uh, WJEC talking videos or videos for the business studies A level. So it would be the, the first section of the A2 level. And uh, quickly before we start, this is a bit of a shout out for um, Joel Needham, whoever you are, uh, whatever college you're from, because you're not one of my students, um, who's been hassling me to make more videos. But um, yeah, I definitely needed to get on them. So it's uh, keep watching because I'm going to be over the next few days updating the playlist and adding all of Unit 3 and some videos for Unit 4 as well. So, first section from Porter, Porter's Five Forces, um, very famous uh, management strategist. So we need to be able to understand the model and apply it to um, an industry or, uh, well, yeah, an industry particularly, but sometimes the questions are on organisations. So, um, the theory basically explains why some industries are more profitable than others. And an important thing is, if you want to really talk about this theory in a correct manner, you don't get industry and business mixed up. So an industry is uh, the group of businesses within it. So, for example, the car uh, industry, um, whereas a business is just an individual business within that industry, such as Honda or Nissan. Um, the Porter's Five Forces model looks at the industry as a whole and explains why some industries are more profitable than others. Now, you, I suppose you can um, apply it to the business level, but it doesn't quite work as well as the business level. It was intended for industry level analysis. So this is the model, and uh, logically you can see that there are five forces. Um, then we'll go through each one of them in turn. So firstly, threat of new entrants. So um, if, if you think back to when you did um, Unit 1, you know, and you were doing market structures as part of the economic section, and barriers to entry were what determined the market structure, and all of these things are barriers to entry, and barriers to entry that stop firms from entering a market. And that can determine uh, the level of profitability profitability in a market. So um, in my little local town, which is Clitheroe uh, in Lancashire, um, there are lots and lots of hairdressers, uh, loads of hairdressers actually, so many to choose from. Uh, and you might think, well, why, why is this? Um, and it's because it's very easy to enter the market and become a, a hairdresser. You don't, you know, I, I hope that most hairdressers do have qualifications. Um, certainly mine has very good qualification. She's very experienced. But actually, legally speaking, you don't need to have um, a qualification in hairdressing to open up as a hairdresser. Um, it's relatively inexpensive to set up. You could set up as a mobile hairdresser at first if you don't have very much money. Um, and there aren't, you know, there's no real patent or patent um, to it. And um, so it's, so it's easy to get into the market. Okay, so if we look at the model, if there's a high threat of new entrants coming into the market, this makes your profit small, as I've got the picture smaller. Um, whereas if there's a low threat of people coming, uh, businesses that is, coming into the market, um, then they're not going to compete away the profit. So you've, you've almost got a more kind of monopoly stance or oligopoly stance. And we know from unit one that uh, the profit is much higher when um, you're a monopoly than when, if, when it's monopolistic competition. Okay, so se secondly, the threat of substitutes. Now to be completely correct about this, a substitute is a product that is uh, fulfills maybe the same purpose. So we've got here an apple and a an eclair, a chocolate eclair, but um, they're actually different from each other. So um, that's why it's industry analysis, not kind of business analysis. So one hairdresser comparing it to another hairdresser, that's, those aren't substitutes, those are just um, competitors. But um, say comparing, you know, if you've got £50 to spend and you can either spend it on um, getting your hair done, well, the substitute for that would be maybe getting your nails done or, um, you know, something else that you could spend that money on. So if there's um, a high threat of substitute products or other things for customers to spend their money on, I suppose, profit tends to be smaller than if there's a low threat of substitutes. And if we have an example here, HMV, why did it go out of business or why did they have to close down a lot of the stores? Why did it go into administration? Well, 
if you think about it, substitutes really. You know, where do we buy our music from these days? Um, iTunes or some people download it illegally. Um, or, you know, when I used to buy d DVDs from HMV, but I don't buy any DVDs anymore because I've got Netflix and I've got Sky and Sky on Demand and, you know, all of those things. So I don't really need the DVDs. In fact, it's a bit of a faff. It's a bit of a hassle to have those DVDs. Um, so we can see there that the threat of substitute was very, very high and therefore it had an impact on their profits and actually forced a lot of the stores out of business. Thirdly, bargaining power of suppliers. Um, so if you're bargaining, if the bargaining power of your suppliers is very high, uh, it reduces your, the profit in the industry. If there's weak bargaining power, uh, the profit in the industry should be a lot higher. Um, a nice example here, farmers, they're known, this is kind of a notorious example with um, supermarkets. So there's so many farmers up and down the country and they have quite weak bargaining power because there are so many of them, you know, and if you, you say to Sainsbury's, I'm not going to supply, I'm not going to provide you with supplies anymore, they'll say, well, all right, I'll go and find another farmer who will because, you know, they're there are others willing to. So there's lots of similar suppliers out there. So they have very weak bargaining power. And that's why, you know, their profit margins are very, very small um, there. So not good news for farmers, but good news for supermarkets because that means that they have uh, larger profits than if their suppliers had got high bargaining power or strong bargaining power and then on the other side we're thinking about the bargaining power of buyers so these are your customers so if they've got strong bargaining power this reduces your profit weak bargaining power um, larger profits in uh, the industry so um, if there are lots and lots of customers um, and they're all spending I suppose a small amount each losing one customer you're not going to lose sleep over it, are you? Uh, if you only have a few customers, or if you only have one customer, uh, called a monopsony. Monop monopsony? I don't think I've pronounced that. Monopsony. Monopsopy. Monops I can never pronounce that word. Type it into Google, <laughs> look it up, try and find out how it's pronounced. I am an economics teacher, actually. I should be able to pronounce that word. Monops. Monopsopy, something like that. Anyway, um, it just means that there's one buyer in the market, um, and they have a, they have a lot of power because they're you know if you lose them you lost your business really. Um, but if you go into McDonald's and say I'm sick of you McDonald's, I'm never buying from you again, would they be bothered? I don't know. Depends. It depends if you buy a McDonald's every day. They might be they might be uh, bothered by that, but they've got so many customers um, that it's unlikely. Um, here I've got an example of British Aerospace and they produce this plane, the Eurofighter jet. Um, it's an interesting industry really because, you know, it doesn't, it's not a nice product, is it? It doesn't do nice things. Um, but, um, you know, besides the ethical debate about these products, um, they only have actually a few customers you can't just kind of rock up to be BAE systems um, and say oh can I buy one of these please you, you know they only sell to certain governments and there are kind of rules and regulations placed on them for that so um, their buyers uh, certain governments have a lot of power and they're not producing um, huge quantities of these the small quantities so uh, again that gives the buyers a lot of power so if they lose a certain government um, a certain government's kind of custom um, that would be a major loss for that business and finally the intensity of rivalry sometimes called jockeying for position so um, Rivalry, this is how much competition really, how competitive the businesses are against each other. You do get some industries where they're not too bothered about competitors, you know, it's the uh, you stick to your patch, I'll stick to my patch. Um, I, funny story actually, um, I uh, was uh, really wanting somebody to clean my windows and they're, they're too high and I tried to get a pole and I couldn't clean them. So one morning I, I came out of the house and there was a window cleaner across the street cleaning the windows of the house across the street. And so I, I walked up to him and I said, oh great, you're a window cleaner. Um, could you come and clean my windows? And he looked at my, he said, which one's your house? And he looked at it and he said, oh no, no, I can't, I can't come and clean 
those windows. And I was like, oh, why not? It's like, that's somebody else's patch. So, you know, they're not, not very competitive, really, the window cleaners of um, uh, Clitheroe. They stick to their own patches and, you know, they, they won't go and kind of scout for business in other people's patches. Um, but there are some companies that do. So uh, EasyJet and Ryanair are quite... Um, they've got quite high intensity of rivalry and um that means that they're you know trying to take customers from each other um and asda sainsbury's morrison's tesco's you know those price promises and price match campaigns at the moment this tends to mean that costs increase because you're spending money on advertising to try and differentiate yourself from your competitors and it also means that um you might lower your prices to be a little bit more competitive and try and sway customers to buy your products and it, uh, <coughs> excuse me I'm choking <coughs> you might um that all both of those things <laughs> both of those things reduce your profit levels now rivalry will tend to be more intense if the products are very similar that are being sold and the competitors are kind of very similar to each other roughly the same size and they have similar strategies you know um Ryanair EasyJet very similar strategies low cost airlines uh, and also it's quite costly to leave the industry so sunk costs or exit costs they're called in economics so here's a nice summary so if you want to pause the presentation there and just have a look at that that's great Here's um, a nice little graph from Porter's article, actually, and it's measuring the profitability of different industries and uh, airlines there at the bottom. Um, and Porter, actually, in this video on uh, YouTube, if you just type in Michael Porter, Harvard Business Review, Five Forces, you should get this video up. Um, and it explains why airlines are so unprofitable. So a very interesting um, theory. Usually the question in the exam is asking you to analyse um, the industry or analyse the business based on Porter's Five Forces. So you just work your way through each one of those five forces and explain how strong those forces are, how strong the threat is or the bargaining power or the rivalry and try and form a conclusion that brings it back round to profitability because that really is the focus of this theory about how these five forces determine the profitability of different industries. Oops. I wasn't meant to do that, I was meant to stop the presentation.